Good morning, church. It's so good to be with you all. I'm delighted to be here on this Easter Sunday. I look around and there's so many new people I don't know yet. This is, this is really good. I would have to say that there's a lot of perspective evangelists in this room. So we're reading from today from Matthew chapter 27, verses 62 through to Matthew 28, verses 1 to 10. So that's Matthew chapter 27, verse 62. On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by at night and steal him away and say to the people, He has risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go go your way, make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him, became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, do not be afraid for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here for he is risen. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay and go and quickly tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples word. And as they went, to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, rejoice. So they came and held him by his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee and there they will see me. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, choir. That was wonderful. I really enjoyed you leading us this morning in worship. And uh, good morning, Resurrection Sunday. Christ is risen. And we rejoice. We celebrate that fact. I want to invite each of you to attend the last day's Bible conference that is coming up uh, Wednesday, April 27th, uh, April 28th, and Wednesday, May 4th, May 5th, and ending Friday, May 6th. Uh, This is going to be live streamed, uh, but you can come and gather. We invite you to come and gather here in this building, and we will uh, make it as real as we can. Uh, Some of the guest speakers are uh, some fellow by the name of Christian Kanyas, our own Christian, uh, Brandon Holthouse, Carl Tykrib, and Tom Hughes, uh, three Americans uh, who specialize in, in prophecy. Uh, topics include a Christian called arms, apostasy, deception in the church, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the rapture, birth pangs of Israel and her covenant with the Antichrist, Putin's religion and the Gog of Magog invasion and uh, many more. 
And so I uh, invite you to come and be part of that. If you can't come and uh, watch it with us here, uh, you can go on to the Last Days Bible Conference website where you can, can register and they'll send a link to you or you can just go straight to that website and access a link there. So we invite you to take advantage of this upcoming opportunity. Let's just bow our hearts in prayer. Heavenly Father, we have so much to give thanks for. And on a day like today, when we set this time aside to especially remember uh, the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord, how we praise and thank you that we serve a risen Savior. And we thank you, Lord, that you so loved us that you sent him to come and take our place and to bear the wrath that uh, we deserved because of our, our rebellion and our sin against you. Lord, you have made us children of God, and we praise you for that. This morning, as we look into your word, we just ask you to open the eyes of our heart that we could understand and cause us, Lord, to believe. And Father, we pray that you would use this congregation to make the good news of your resurrection known far and wide, that there might be many others added to the family of God. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we're going to uh, take a closer look at the passage that Chris just read for us this morning from Matthew chapter 27 and 28. I don't know if very many of you here would know an old African-American hymn titled, uh, Were You There? It asks in a very curious and yet profound way through the lyrics of the song these questions. Have you been crucified with Christ? Have you been buried with him and raised from the dead with Christ to walk in newness of life? Here's how the lyrics go. I'm not going to sing it for you, but I'll, I'll read the lyrics. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they laid him in a tomb? Were you there? when they laid him in a tomb. Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when he rose up from the dead? Were you there when he rose up from the dead? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when he rose up from the dead? I trust by the end of the, the message this morning, you will be able to answer these questions in the affirmative. Yes, praise the Lord, I was there by the grace of God. In the Old Testament sacrificial system, on a regular basis, everyone would have to offer a sacrificial lamb from time to time which would be put to death in their place as a substitutionary payment for their sin. Imagine the visual impact it would have as a family led their lamb that they had raised and cared for, taking it to the temple, to the altar of sacrifice. And they would gather around that little lamb that they had nurtured and raised, and they would collectively place their hands on its head, and an exchange would take place. All of their sin was then symbolically transferred or downloaded onto that innocent lamb, and the lamb's innocence was symbolically transferred onto the family. And then the priest would kill the lamb as a substitute, taking the place of that family, bearing all their sin so that the family could be forgiven of their sin and walk away free. Not only did the sinner symbolically transfer his or her sin onto that lamb, 
but they also symbolically transferred their sinful identity to that lamb. And that lamb took on the sinner's identity. When the lamb was killed, it was taking the place of the sinner. Symbolically, the sinless lamb became the sinner and suffered the penalty of death in the sinner's place. But this was only symbolic, for the lamb could never take away anyone's sin. Only a perfect, sinless man could pay the penalty for another human. Jesus, the perfect, sinless Son of God, came down to this world as the Lamb of God. He became a man so that he could be our substitute, so he could take upon himself our sin, but best of all, not just symbolically, but literally. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ and accept him as our substitute, a miracle takes place in our inmost being. A transaction is enacted. Like the Old Testament sinners who placed their hands on the head of the lamb, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, this exchange takes place. He takes upon himself our identity and our sin, and in exchange, he transfers to us his righteousness and his life. Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us, and we who were sinners became the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 declares that. The Bible teaches that God supernaturally placed our old life into Jesus Christ. This is a miracle. It's described as a mystery in the Bible. But he placed our old life into Christ. And in the body of Jesus, God punished all of our sin and executed the death penalty against our old sinful nature that had been placed into Jesus Christ. Look with me in your Bible to uh, Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And <clears throat> Romans chapter 6, verse 3. I like to encourage the congregation to bring your Bible, uh, use your Bible. That's how you get to know your Bible. And... And it's also how you keep me accountable. Check with your Bible. Make sure this is so. Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, and that word baptized means uh, to be plunged into or to be placed into, to be immersed into Jesus Christ, so as many of us as were plunged into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death, or we were plunged into his death, we were placed into his death. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. Romans 3, 6, our old man was crucified with him. So when Christ died, where were you? Romans 6, 6, Galatians 2, 20, tell us, you were crucified with him. So that when he died, your sinful spirit was on the cross with him. And you say, well, I don't remember that. I'm sure I would remember that. Do you remember being in your mother's womb? <laughs> you were there. You were there. And just as truly, spiritually, when Christ hung on the cross, if you are a child of God, you were there. Have you ever, have you never experienced this amazing exchange? Have you never seen in yourself this before what I once was and the after what, praise God, I now am? Do you have a wicked, evil life that you would like to put to death? 
Satan's lie is that suicide is the solution. But then forever you will be separated from God bearing the guilt of your sin. Suicide doesn't do away with the sinful nature. It just plunges you into an eternal lost state. God's solution is for you to give that old life to Jesus and God will take you back through time and place you into Jesus Christ and crucify you with him. So let's go back to the cross in Matthew chapter 27 and see what happened after Jesus died. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 57 now when the evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock and he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. Now, if God has placed your old sinful nature into Jesus Christ at the cross, and you were crucified with Christ, then when they buried Christ, where were you? Buried with him. Romans 6, verse 4. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. So when they buried Christ, they buried your old sinful nature with him. While Jesus was in the grave, the Bible tells us that as far as the east is from the west, so far God has removed our transgression from us. Therefore, when Christ died, your old nature, who you used to be, died. And when Christ was buried, your sin, your past, and even that old wicked nature was buried with him and permanently removed from you as far as the east can be removed from the west, never to be brought back again. Never to be brought back again. When you surrender your life to Jesus Christ and trust in him to be your savior, he permanently removes your old life and the person you used to be no longer exists. It's gone. It's gone. This is why so many in this room sing with joy. We sing because we have been set free from the guilt the shame, and the sin of our past. Praise God. Praise God. We've been set free. Do you have a life and a bunch of sin that you would like to be set free from? You can give it to Jesus, and he will remove it. A large round rock was then rolled in front of the tomb to keep out grave robbers and wild animals. The rock was large enough that it would have required several strong men to move it. And we read in verse 62 of Matthew 27. On the next day, that's the Saturday following Good Friday, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate. Pilate was the governor of Rome. And saying, sir, we... We remember while he was still alive how that deceiver, referring to Jesus, said, after three days I will rise. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead, so the last deception will be worse than the first. Calling our Christ a deceiver. The first deception that they refer to is Jesus' claim to be the Messiah, the Son of God, and the promised great King of Israel. The last deception that they're referring to would be his claim to rise from the dead in order to prove that he was the Son of God. There could be no greater proof that Jesus is the Son of God than for him to rise from the dead 
as he promised that he would. And so they want the tomb secured to ensure that no one could steal his body and then claim that he had risen. And I suspect there was a little bit of a fear in him that, in them that maybe if he did rise, at least if the tomb is sealed, he can't get out. I don't know what was going through their minds. It wasn't good. But it begs the question, why is it that Jesus' enemies remembered that he said he would rise again? But his own disciples had forgotten as they are in mourning. Look at how Jesus had repeatedly spoken to his disciples foretelling his death and his resurrection. Go back with me to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Let's look at verses 38, 39, and 40. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying to Jesus, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation <clears throat> seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The implication is that as Jonah was only three days in the belly of the fish, so the Son of Man would be only three days in the heart of the earth, that he would arise after the third day. Uh, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 21. This is a little bit later on. <clears throat> From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. Jesus declares this to him now for the second time. Look to Matthew chapter 17, the next chapter, verse 22. Now while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. Uh, it seems that Right from the beginning, all they could focus on was he's going to be killed. They weren't focused on he's going to be raised up. Matthew chapter 20. Verse 17. Now Jesus going up to Jerusalem took the 12 disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the, by, to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify, and the third day he will rise again. Pretty precise prophecy. And if you've read the rest of the story, it was exactly fulfilled as it was spoken. That is a pattern in all of prophecy. All of Jesus' own disciples should have been standing outside his tomb early on that resurrection morning with uh, their helium balloons and their party blowers and filled with expectancy. Just like today, we should be all eagerly anticipating his promised return. Verse 65, Matthew chapter 27. And Pilate said to these chief priests and Pharisees, you have a guard, go your way, make it as secure as you know how. And so they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. So the tomb was, 
was sealed shut and a guard of Roman soldiers who would work in, in shifts uh, 24 hours a day were placed in front of the tomb to guard it. And anyone who tried taking Jesus' body would have a real fight on their hands. In Matthew 28, verse 1, now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And this is early in the morning, that first Easter morning. And verse 2, Behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. It was Jerusalem's wake-up call to shake the entire city out of their beds. It didn't just rattle the dishes. It was a great earthquake. And it was to let the city of Jerusalem know that their king had risen triumphantly from the dead just as he repeatedly said he would. He was the Messiah. He was God. He was our risen Savior. And the angel's countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. While the earth was shaking under the feet of these mighty trained Roman soldiers who have witnessed much in battle, they saw for the first time one of Jesus' truly mighty soldiers who single-handedly rolled back the massive stone that was sealing the entrance to the tomb. Now, I don't know what kind of image is conjured up in your mind when you think of God's mighty angels. It would take a lot to frighten these battle-hardened soldiers, and yet the awesome sight of this one angel so terrified the soldiers that they fell to the ground trembling and became paralyzed with fear. These were awesome beings. These are awesome beings. And after what the angel saw the soldiers do to Jesus at the cross, they witnessed it, they saw it, and they had orders to stand back and let it unfold. But I'm sure at this opportunity it must have given this angel some satisfaction to terrify these soldiers. Picture the Hulk. You know. <laughs> and I'm sure he didn't just stand there and look at them. There was probably, uh, you know, <laughs> I saw what you did to Jesus. The angel of the Lord didn't roll back the stone to let Jesus out, he was gone but it was to let the soldiers and the rest of the world look inside and see that the tomb was empty. Amen. You guys have guarded it. You sealed it. You know nobody got in, but it's empty. Jesus had risen, and he was alive. And while the Roman guards are still passed out on the ground from fear, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary arrive and find the tomb empty, and the angel watching it. And we read in verse 5, but the angel, now obviously presenting himself much more gently to these ladies than he had to the soldiers, he answered and said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. Easter is such an important time to us because the resurrection of Jesus Christ is crucial to the Christian faith. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14 and 17, we read in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14, 
If Christ had not been raised from the dead, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. In verse 17, and if Christ has not been raised from the dead, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. If our Savior was still dead, then there would be no hope for our salvation. A dead Savior cannot save anyone. This is why we Christians don't use the, the Catholic crucifix. It portrays a dead Jesus still hanging on the cross. And a dead Savior can't save anyone. But Jesus is not dead, for he is risen, as he said. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead affects not only him, but it affects all of us who by faith are in him. Now, if our old sinful nature was crucified with Christ, was buried with Christ, removed from us as far as the east is from the west, what happened to us when Jesus rose from the dead? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, 5, and 6 say, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, made us alive together with Christ. Let me read that again. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and he raised us up together with Christ. You were placed into Christ when you put your faith in him. And you were crucified with him, that old man, that old nature. You were buried with him, that old man, that old nature, and removed from you as far as the east is from the west, never to come back again. So what was raised with Christ? When Jesus rose from the grave, he left our old nature in the grave. But we have a new nature. A new nature, where did it come from? comes from Christ himself. And when he rose, we, our new nature, rose with him. The Bible teaches us that as believers, we've received a new nature from Christ, a new sinless spirit, not from Adam, but from Jesus. Ephesians 1.4 says that we, that is our new spirits, we're in Christ before the foundation of the world, before the world was created, before Adam was created. The new nature, the new life that you have now is, was in Christ. It was in Christ before he created the world. And therefore, when Jesus rose from the dead, our new righteous Christian life, which had been in Christ since before creation, rose with Christ from the dead. We rose with him, and because Jesus rose, we now have eternal life. We now have his life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. 2 Corinthians 5. 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if you put your faith in Christ as your Savior, as your Lord, as your life, he is a new creation. Old things, the old life has passed away. Crucified, buried, forever removed. Behold, all things have become new. You've got a new life, brothers and sisters. We have not merely been renovated, cleaned up a bit, new paint job, made to look a little better, but the old man has been put to death, buried, forever gone. We now have a new spirit, a new nature, which is the essence of who we are. It comes from Christ. It makes us new people, and better yet, it makes us children of God born of him. The life comes from him. That's how we can be called children. We truly are children of God. And when this happens, Jesus called it being born again. And therefore, we no longer belong to this world. We have new citizenship. We are citizens of heaven. And if you have been born again, you discover that you no longer fit 
quite right in this world. It doesn't suit you anymore because you are no longer part of this world. Another blessing is that because our old life has been crucified, buried, and now gone, God will never punish you for your past life. It has already been put to death and removed from you, never to be held against you. And later that same resurrection morning, Jesus appeared to his disciples. Uh, turn to John's gospel, John chapter 20. John chapter 20, verse 19. Then the same day at evening, this is Resurrection Sunday, but it's at the end of the day, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. The resurrected Christ breathed on his followers, giving them a new spiritual life, which was a brand new life and a brand new identity. And the same is true today. We receive new spiritual life the moment we put our faith in Jesus Christ and receive him as our Lord by faith. So I'll come back and ask you the question. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when he was buried in the tomb? Were you there when he rose up from the dead? If you have, by faith, exchanged your life for his and been born again, then yes, you were united with Christ in his death, united with Christ in his burial, and a new you was united with Christ in his resurrection. You were there. If you have never trusted in Jesus to change you and give you this new life, you can enter into that exchange today. I invite you to put your faith in Jesus Christ as your substitutionary lamb who can take away your sin. Not just symbolically, literally, he will take it away. Offer to him your old life, confess to him your sin, and ask him to take your old life away, to take your sin away, to take it all away. And let Jesus know that you want a new life, that you want his life, and he will exchange your old life of sin and give you his life of righteousness, and then he will put his spirit inside of you, and you will be born again. You will be a child of God. You will be a citizen of heaven, no longer part of this world. It's a miracle. It's a miracle that has been made possible because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he rose from the dead to prove that he is God and he can do what he promises. And he has promised to give you this new life in exchange for your old, if you will trust him. Will you trust him? Will you trust him? Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the power of the cross to deal with our sin. And thank you for the power of the resurrection to give us new life. And thank you for your grace toward us and the invitation you have extended to us. Thank you, Lord, that you desire to make us your children. And thank you, Lord, for many in this room, you have already made us your children. Oh, how we praise you. We thank you that we have been born again. We thank you that that old life of wickedness and sin and rebellion and emptiness is gone. And you've given us new life. You've given us new purpose. 
And you are in the process of conforming us to the likeness of Jesus Christ. And one day that process will be complete. You are coming back for your church. You're coming to take your children home. And we will forever live with you. Here on this earth in your kingdom and in your heavenly home, Lord, what a glorious future you have given us. And we thank and praise you for it. I pray this morning that you would cause faith to arise in the hearts of those who have never yet entered into this exchange, who have never yet by faith given you their life in exchange for yours. I pray that you would compel them. I pray, Father, that you would draw them, that you would fill their hearts even now with great desire for you and the life that you offer us. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. And Lord, as we're praying, we've got many others on our mind who we love and care for, scattered around this world, who are not part of the family. They have not exchanged their lost life for your life. Lord, we pray that you would use us. We pray that you would work in the hearts of of those that are on our minds right now who need you. We pray for their salvation. And we ask that you would empower us, that you would embolden us, that you would fill our mouths with words, and that you would provide opportunities to encounter, to share, to declare this good news, and to invite them to enter into the family of God. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And kill.